My next few videos are going to be about explaining the weather. You may know that hurricanes spin counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere. This is a direct result of the fact that the Earth is spinning to the east. To understand what's really going on, you have to understand the Coriolis force. The Coriolis force has to do with reference frames. Whenever you measure an object's position or velocity, you're measuring it from a particular reference frame. And the frame of reference you use is very important. If you're on Earth, a great choice for your frame of reference is Earth. Theoretically, you could try to use outer space, but it's so hard to measure your position in space or even keep track of it as the Earth is moving. So Earth is a much more convenient reference frame. But there's a problem with Earth. Earth is spinning. When you use a spinning reference frame, Newton's laws of motion get a lot more complicated. Now you may not know this because we try to avoid using rotating frames of reference whenever we can. Normally we describe motion on a normal non-rotating frame of reference, like outer space. And it makes things so much simpler. If no forces are acting upon an object, the object moves in a straight line. And force equals mass times acceleration. If you want to use a rotating reference frame, you have to add in two extra forces, the centrifugal force and the Coriolis force. So at first, I didn't think the Coriolis force was all that complicated. I thought I could explain it in like two minutes. Um, but a lot of people get it wrong. In fact, there are like textbooks with this wrong. Um, I spent weeks arguing with experts. I rewrote this thing about five times. And I kept realizing that I wasn't happy with any of the explanations that were out there. There are a couple different approaches you can take. One approach is you could just run through all the math. You just write down a bunch of equations and out pops the Coriolis force. That's not a bad approach, but I don't feel like it gives you a very good intuition about what's going on. So I wanted to come up with a, a visual way of explaining it. Now there is a very popular explanation for this. You can find hundreds of videos with this explanation, including one of mine, the one about Copernicus. The problem is, it's not exactly correct. So we're gonna go through this explanation. If it doesn't make sense, don't worry about it. It's not even right. Imagine there's a girl named Alice and she's at the equator. She wants to throw a ball to her friend Bob in America. Now it might be hard to throw a ball that far. Let's not worry about that. She could shoot a missile if you'd like. Remember, the earth is spinning. Since Alice is at the equator, she's spinning faster than Bob. Alice is moving at 1,000 miles per hour to the east, but Bob is only moving at about 800 miles per hour. When Alice throws the ball to Bob, the ball is launched with this extra speed. And so the ball moves ahead of Bob. It moves to the east of Bob. All right, what's wrong with this explanation? It does predict a Coriolis force to the east, which is correct, but it underestimates the strength of this force. The difference in speed between Alice and Bob can only explain half the Coriolis force. This explanation would work if Alice and Bob continued moving in a straight line, but their velocities are also changing over time. They're both turning. This change in velocity contributes half of the Coriolis force. And there's another problem. We only looked at the case where Bob was to the north or to the south of Alice. What if Bob was to the east or west? Guess what? there's still a Coriolis force, and this doesn't really explain why. This explanation is incomplete. It doesn't give you the whole story. And now, I'm going to attempt to give you a more complete explanation of the Coriolis force. And this is gonna get a little complicated, I'm sorry. How is a rotating reference frame different from a normal reference frame? Normal reference frames are called inertial frames. Let's take a point in the inertial frame and convert it into the rotating frame. All we do is we apply a rotation that's changing over time. So what we see in the rotating frame is that the point moves in a circular path. Now let's go in the opposite direction. Imagine we have a fixed point in the rotating frame. What happens in the inertial frame? It's just the reverse. We do a rotation in the opposite direction. We can also do this for multiple objects. The angle of each object is changing over time. But notice, it's changing at the same rate for every object. 
So if you compare the angle of any two objects with respect to the center, the relative angle between them does not change between the two frames. And there's another thing that doesn't change between the two frames, the distance to the center. When you apply a rotation, the distance to the center or the radius does not change. It's always the same in the two frames. Now let's put some objects in motion. To keep things simple, any object that is colored blue or green has no forces acting upon it in the inertial frame. Since there are no forces, the blue and green objects move in a straight line through the inertial frame. But that's not what happens in the rotating frame. In the rotating frame, the objects move as if there was some force acting upon them. But this is not real. The, these are fictitious forces. They're not in the inertial frame. They're just a result of using a rotating frame. Our goal is to figure out how these fictitious forces work. We want to compare how these objects move against how we expect them to move. We expect them to move without these fictitious forces. We expect them to move in straight lines. Red and orange objects will move how we expect them to within the rotating frame. They will either move in a straight line or not move at all. By comparing the red and blue objects, we will figure out why the blue objects move differently from what we expect within the rotating frame. To keep things simple, the red and blue objects always start at the same position and velocity, but then they will slowly diverge over time. And the difference is that the blue object is moving in a straight line in the inertial frame, while the red object is moving in a straight line in the rotating frame. We'll start with the simplest case. Here, the red object does not move in the rotating frame, but it is moving in the inertial frame. We'll start the blue object at the same position and velocity and see what happens. What we see is that the blue object moves away from the center. In the inertial frame, it's moving straight, which causes the radius to increase. And remember, the radius is the same in both frames. In the rotating frame, it looks like it's being pushed by some outward force. This is called the centrifugal force. Centrifugal means away from the center. You're probably familiar with this force. When you're riding a car and the car turns, you feel oh. an acceleration. <laughs> Notice that the blue object moves out, but it also moves to the right. There are actually two forces involved here. There's a centrifugal force pushing it out, but as the object moves out, the Coriolis force kicks in and pushes it to the right. The Coriolis force depends on the velocity of the object inside the rotating frame. If there's no velocity, there's no Coriolis force. If the object is moving out away from the center, the Coriolis force points backwards against the direction of rotation. If the object is moving in, the Coriolis force points forwards. If the object is moving forwards, the Coriolis force points out. If the object is moving backwards, the Coriolis force points in. To summarize, there's always a centrifugal force that's pushing out. If the object is moving in the rotating frame, there's also a Coriolis force. To demonstrate the Coriolis force, we're going to compare two pairs of objects, the blue-red pair starts with no initial velocity. The green-orange pair is initially moving up or out from the center. Because it's moving out, there is a Coriolis force pushing it backwards or to the right. Because the blue object is not moving, it has no Coriolis force in the beginning. I'm going to explain why moving the green object up results in a Coriolis force pushing it right. We're going to look at the angles of each object with respect to the center. First, look at the orange object. It's moving up within the rotating frame, but notice this doesn't affect its angle with respect to the center. The angle of the orange object and the angle of the red object are the same within the rotating frame. And remember, relative angles don't change between frames, so the red and orange object also have the same angle within the inertial frame. Now let's compare the blue and green objects. They're both moving to the left but the green object is also moving upwards. This upward motion changes the angle with respect to the center. The green angle is not increasing as quickly as the blue angle. Now let's switch to the rotating frame. Remember, relative angles are the same between the two frames. So the angle between the blue and red object is the same in both frames. 
the angle between the green and orange object is the same in both frames. The result is that the green object moves more to the right than the blue object. To summarize, the upward motion of the green object resulted in a smaller change in its angle. The relative angle is the same in the rotating frame, so this caused the green object to move to the right. Now let's move the green object in the opposite direction, down. This has the opposite effect. Now the angle of the green object is increasing more rapidly than the blue object. Again, this motion does not affect the angle of the orange object, and again, the relative angles are the same between the two frames. The result is that the green object moves more to the left than the blue object. Now let's look at the case where the green and orange objects are moving to the right, which is against the direction of rotation. The Coriolis force should point in towards the center. So we're going to look at the distance from the center, or the radius, and see how it changes over time. Remember, the radius is the same between the two frames. So for any objects, we can measure the radius in whichever frame we want. It doesn't make any difference. So we're going to measure the blue and green objects in the inertial frame, and the red and orange objects in the rotating frame. This is the easiest choice, as then all these objects are moving horizontally at a constant speed. Remember, the blue-red pair is the same as the green-orange pair, except the green-orange pair has some additional velocity to the right. Now let's compare the pairs of objects. The blue object moves away from the center as a result of the centrifugal force. The green object is moving more to the right, and that means that the green radius is smaller than the blue radius. It's even smaller than the orange radius, which is where it would be if it had no fictitious forces acting upon it. So the Coriolis force is pushing in and acting against the centrifugal force. When an object is moving to the right in the rotating frame, it's going against the direction of motion. This is slowing it down in the inertial frame. And by slowing it down, the radius is not increasing as fast. So that means it's going in. So the Coriolis force is pushing in. Finally, there's one more case to consider. This is the case where the green-orange object is moving to the left, which is forward into the direction of rotation. Let's do the same thing we did before, where we look at the, how the radius of the objects change over time. Again, the green-orange pair is the same as the blue-red pair, just with some extra velocity to the left. Now let's compare the difference between the radius of the blue versus the red objects and the green versus the orange objects. There's a greater difference between the green and orange objects. The blue object is moving out because of the centrifugal force, but the green object is moving out even faster because the Coriolis force is also pushing out. When an object is moving to the left in the rotating frame, it's moving into the direction of rotation. That means it's speeding up in the inertial frame. And by speeding up, the radius is increasing faster than it otherwise would. So the Coriolis force is pushing out. To summarize, we've been going back and forth between a rotating frame and an inertial frame. If you use the normal laws of motion in the inertial frame, then these fictitious forces just pop up in the rotating frame. In the rotating frame, there's a centrifugal force pushing out plus the Coriolis force whenever the objects are moving. Now we know how the Coriolis force works within a rotating reference frame. And we know the Earth is rotating. So how does this work on Earth? All we need to do is figure out the directions. Which direction is forwards? That's into the direction of rotation. Which way's backwards? Which way's in? Which way's out? The sun rises in the east. The Earth is spinning towards the east. So east is forwards. Which way's in? Well, that depends on which hemisphere you're using. In the northern hemisphere, as you go north, you get closer to the axis of rotation. So north is in. But in the southern hemisphere, it's the other way around. As you go south, you get closer to the axis. Below the equator, south is in. Above it, north is in. Now let's fill in this chart for Earth. Forwards is east. Backwards is west. In the northern hemisphere, in is north, out is south. The Coriolis force always pushes to the right in the northern hemisphere. In the southern hemisphere, the in and out directions are reversed. 
everything now goes in the opposite direction. The Coriolis force pushes to the left. The Coriolis force only affects things that are really big or really fast, such as global weather patterns. This doesn't affect small things like how you play a game of catch or which way your toilet drains. For more astronomical videos, please click to subscribe.